is the, uh, the spirit in the cross, uh, the name of the, uh, of the series. And the subtitle and, and the, the meaning of the subtitle will come more clearly into view as we you know, get deeper into the material. And so the subtitle is the work of the Holy Spirit in the process of salvation. And this is lesson number two. And the uh, title of this lesson is the Holy Spirit is God. We're going to review that idea. In our previous lesson, we noted the following, just as a bit of a refresher here. First of all, all the information that we have about the Holy Spirit is contained in the Bible. Second Peter tells us that, Jude chapter three, we looked at that last week. Our study therefore uh, would be based only on what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit not personal experiences. I've been at places where people talk about, the, they want to talk about, have a quote Bible study about the Holy Spirit. And then all of a sudden somebody says, oh, I remember once, you know, on a dark night and I was in prayer and the spirit came to, yeah, we don't do that. Or my aunt just before she died, you know, heard a voice, you know, that, that's, all, that's offside. The only source material we're using to study the Holy Spirit is the Bible, period. What the Bible says about the Holy Spirit and not personal experience or stories that other people have, have claimed. Also, we examine the history of the term Trinity, the Trinity, and even though this word does not appear in the Bible, it does describe the biblical concept of a triune God. In other words, the dynamic nature of God. They had to find a word to dis describe that. So they picked the word Trinity. And again, we talked about that last week. I, I also introduced the idea of progressive revelation, which simply referred to the gradual method that God has used to reveal information about his, himself and his will from mankind. You know, Adam and Eve didn't just get everything, all the information at once, uh, or Abraham or David, you know, slowly but surely God provided information to reveal more of his person, more of his will, more of the, you know, the big plan. So we call that progressive uh, revelation. Uh, also one example of this progressive revelation has been the gradual revealing of the dynamic nature of God's deity consisting of three distinct beings within a single Godhead. That's one of, the, uh, one of the ideas that has been revealed, you know, uh, progressively throughout the Bible. All right, all the information about God and what he is like and so on and so forth is not contained in one single verse. You have to go from Genesis all the way to the end to get the full picture, okay? Uh, so in the second lesson, we're gonna to continue to develop the idea of the Trinity and, and observe how God, through progressive revelation, clarifies our understanding of his true uh, godly nature. All right, so the triune nature of God in the Old Testament. Now I mentioned before that the Old Testament focused on the oneness of God and his supremacy and his uniqueness primarily to separate the God of the Jews from the myriad of gods worshiped by the Gentiles who worshiped many gods and they worshiped them simultaneously. You know, the more the better. They had a God for the weather, they had a God for fertility, they had a God for a war, they had, you know, uh, they had uh, many different uh, gods. Uh, some researchers estimate that there are more than 234 deities recorded in ancient Ugari uh, Ugaritic texts. In other words, religious Canaanite tablets contain evidence that they worship at least 234 different gods. So this is one of the reasons that the leaders and the prophets of the Jews emphasized the uniqueness and the supremacy of God 
Jehovah in that he was not only a God like, you know, number 235, as far as the Gentiles were concerned, but that he was the one and only God to counterbalance, to counteract the prevalent thought among Gentile nations at that time, that there were many gods. This is why you have the Shema, you know, the Lord is one, there's only one God. They emphasized this portion of revelation was emphasized in the Old Testament, uh, among other things for that particular uh, reason. Um, in other words, all of the 234 gods were not deity because they didn't have the attributes of the God of the Jews, witnessed by the miracles that he performed among them since Abraham, uh, but especially the miracles he performed in freeing them from the Egyptian slavery, witnessed by surrounding nations. Remember, these millions of Jews wandering in the desert for 40 years, that didn't happen like in a vacuum. That didn't happen in secrecy. The nations that lived you know, around the, the desert were very well aware of how the Jews were liberated from Egypt. You know, the, the things that happened in Egypt, they were aware of that. And they were also well aware of these people in the desert being sustained not just day after day, but year after year, decade after decade. And, 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 and the amazing things that were happening among that people. And so through their witness, they were demonstrating the power of their God, of the Jewish God. So when they made the claim that there's only one God and the supporting evidence of that one God. You don't believe there's only one God and he's our God? Have you seen what he's done for us? Have any of your gods done the same for you? So this was the, this was the uh, argument. Nevertheless, the pagan tribes in the land of Canaan and later the Gentile nations that surrounded the Israelites all had pagan deities that they continued to worship. And the central focus of the Jewish religion that there was only one true God and that only they were his worshipers and only the temple in Jerusalem contained his presence on earth where he could be properly worshiped. That was the bottom line of the Jewish religion. We worship the true God and the true God is worshiped in Jerusalem. This is where the revelation of the true God stood until Jesus appeared. You have to understand, it wasn't just that Jesus came along and said he was the Messiah and he came along and you know, he kind of uh, you know, put the Pharisees in their place. You know, they couldn't trick him and he wasn't afraid of the, the high priests or anything like that. It wasn't that. I mean, that was part of it. You know? It was this paradigm shift uh, that took place when Jesus arrived, that they were uh, moving away from the idea of just one God to beginning to, 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 to uh, apprehend the idea that there was, you know, that God was dynamic. You know, they, in, in their minds, the Messiah was not God himself coming to earth in the form of a man. Their idea was that the Messiah was a man, and he, but he was a dynamic man, and he was a powerful man, and he would uh, you know, lead the nation as other great leaders had led the nation in the past. You know, they, that's where they were at. When Jesus comes along, wow, <laughs> that, that was a lot to take in. That God said, we say it like, you know, God sent his son. Yeah, sure, we hear that every Sunday. We, we say that in our prayers, but they never heard anything like that. that. That was brand new for them. So this is where the revelation of the true God stood until Jesus appeared. And with his appearance came new information about the nature of God's being not previously known. Now. It was implicitly prophesied, but it was not clearly revealed in the Old Testament. Okay, Isaiah talked about, you know, the suffering servant and all that. 
Isaiah you know, uh, alluded to it in his prophecy, but it wasn't quite described clearly and crisply you know, as it was when Jesus came and uh, identified who he was. We have several passages that show or teach that God's nature or God's being has the dynamic element of plurality. And this was the, this was the, you know, this was the, the, the problem, uh, the plurality of God that just went against everything. You know, that Jesus said he was God. Wait, wait a minute, there's only one God, he's in heaven. How come you say you're God? And you're promising the spirit, another God. So that was a lot for them to take in. So several passages that show or teach that God's nature or being has the dynamic element of plurality. One passage, Matthew chapter three, it says, after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were open and he saw the spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So this is Matthew's description of Jesus's baptism uh, by John the Baptist. Note that Matthew records the amazing and revelatory scene where all three beings within the Godhead are manifested physically at the same time, separately and in the same location. I mean, that's amazing. The son, the father speaks, there's his physical presence. The father speaks, the son is present in physical form as a man, and the Holy Spirit appears as a dove. I mean, all three persons in the Godhead appear all at once in the same place together. This, this is an amazing passage. As I said, the Father speaks to bless and acknowledge the Son. The Son is in the appearance of a man, Jesus, obeying the Father's command through, through John to be baptized. And the Holy Spirit appears as a dove, symbolizing the power of God in Jesus, legitimizing and empowering his mission to die on the cross and then to resurrect from it. Note that God is present, manifesting the three beings of his divine nature, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Another passage, Matthew 28, it says, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you and lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. So here we have Jesus giving his apostles the great commission. But notice how he frames the authority that supports the baptizing of believers, transforming them into disciples. The command is go make disciples. How? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. What's understood here is the preaching, the preaching that preaches the gospel that ends in the baptism of the repentant believers. He says, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son of the Holy Spirit. We see that all three beings are presented uh, as a unit without distinct deity and uh, they are authoritative. They all have the same authority. So to baptize in the name of one is to do so in the name and the authority of all three. You know, in Acts uh, chapter two, verse 38, Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And there's this debate, you know, less so now, but I remember several years back, you know, people say, if you've been baptized in the name of Jesus, 
You know, because if you haven't been baptized in the name of Jesus, you have to be rebaptized. you know. And of course, a simple misunderstanding. If you baptize in the name of the Son, you're baptizing in the name of the Father and the Spirit, because they're one. And the formula was given in Matthew 28. And the result is, those of you who have done or do baptism, you either baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, calling on the deity to you know, bless what you're doing, the authority for what you're doing, or you're, you're baptizing in the name of Jesus, which is the same thing, okay? And I mean, churches split over this type of, of, uh, of business. It's, it's, very, it's very sad. Luke 135 is our next passage. <clears throat> it says here, the angel answered and said to her, of course, this is the angel Gabriel speaking to Mary. It says, the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. So here the angel Gabriel is explaining to Mary how she will conceive a child since she is a virgin and she plans to stay that way until she marries. The angel informs her that God himself will make her conceive and specifies that the Holy Spirit will accomplish this. This is how the Son of God is mentioned as well, notice the Son of God is mentioned as well as the Holy Spirit. The angel refers to the Holy Spirit as a distinct and different uh, entity uh, from the Father or the Son, but as deity nevertheless with divine authority. You have to have divine authority to miraculously impregnate uh, a woman. Uh, and so we see another reference here. Remember what we're doing. What does the scripture say about the dynamic you know, plurality of the nature of the Godhead. What does it have to say? So these are the passages that give us information uh, about this. Another passage, 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says, the grace of the Lord Jesus, this is Paul you know, addressing the Corinthians, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I mean, does it get any clearer? This is a salutation and a blessing from Paul to the church in Corinth. In the other passages, we had apostles and disciples recording what they saw and what they heard concerning this dynamic nature of God's being. But in this passage, we have an inspired apostle himself uh, 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 using what by now has been revealed about God in his communication with the church. You ask yourself, well, how long did the church know? When did the church know about the Trinity? Well, they knew it certainly by the time the church in Corinth had been formed because you know, Paul is addressing them using you know, uh, a description of this uh, nature. So, <clears throat> Notice that each is referred to as a distinct being, the Lord Jesus Christ, comma, and the love of God, comma, God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, comma, just grammatically, just from a grammar perspective. These are three, you know, you separate distinct things. You know, I want you to buy some apples, comma, eggs, comma, uh, fruit and milk, you know. Individual things are separated by commas. This is what goes on here. Um, he also names, one other thing about this passage, interesting, he also names Jesus before he names the Father. He names Jesus first, then the Father, then the Holy Spirit, to show that they are equally divine. It's not that the Father is just a tiny bit more divine than the Son, and then the Son has just you know, a little more juice than the Holy Spirit, no. They, they're equal, they're, they're the same. 
not this week, and I think it'll be in next week's lesson, I have a chart that I'm going to show you that, uh, that describes each being in the Godhead and uh, you know, describes their character and it'll develop this idea a little more. But like I say, you can't say everything there is to say in 30 minutes, so we have to break it up. Another passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse four to six, it says, now there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are a variety of ministries and the same Lord. There are a variety of effects, but the same God who works all things in all, uh, in all persons. So here we see that in the New Testament church age, God is represented by three distinct persons. Three persons, divine, distinct, and in one source, the Godhead. That's another word that we use to try to you know, get our hands or get our arms around this, this complex nature uh, of, of God. So the Trinity, therefore, is a term used to refer to the complex and dynamic being that we call God. Three beings in one. Now, the Trinity is not, let's, let's play that game, okay. The Trinity is not three personalities of the same God. You have only one God and sometimes he's the father and then sometimes for another reason he's the son and then sometimes he puts on his Holy Ghost uniform and he's the Holy Ghost. There's, there's that thinking. In Ephesians 4, uh, Paul you know, discounts this idea, verse 4, 4 to 6. He says, there's one body, one spirit, just as uh, also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So he's specifying here, you know, uh, uh, there's one body. What, what, what body is he referring to? Well, that's the church, right? And then he says in one spirit, just as you call, one hope. That's a different thing, right? He said there's one body and there's one hope. Is the body the same thing as the hope? No. Is the word body another word for hope? No, there, there are two things he's describing. Then he says uh, of your calling one Lord, one faith. Is the one body the same thing as the one faith? Well, no. Or the one hope? No, I'm just trying to get across the idea that he's describing distinct things that are different from each other. And in the passage where he's doing that, he mentions this, this time he starts with the spirit and then mentions the son, the Lord, and then mentions the father third. So we have, you know, in Matthew 28, Matthew says the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Then in another passage, it's the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. And in this passage, it's the Spirit, the Son, and the Father. You know, you, know, you can only do that if they're the same. Another thing that the uh, Trinity is not, three different gods cooperating together on behalf of mankind. Even Jesus quotes the Shema in Mark 12, 28. This type of idea is like the Greek and Roman gods. You know, this idea of three different gods cooperating on behalf of mankind. That idea is drawn from Greek and Roman religions who had you know, many gods and the gods had alliances. The gods had wives. The gods fought with one another or they had alliances together. They had different character, but they were, they were different gods. The, the Trinity is not that. God is one entity with three separate divine beings interacting among themselves. In Genesis 1:26, for example, it says, the Godhead says, let us make man. Let us make man. Who's the us? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Make man. 
and also manifesting himself dynamically to mankind. You know, as I mentioned in Jesus' baptism, physical representation of each one. The Holy Spirit, who is the main topic of this series, is one of the distinct beings of the Godhead. So when we study or discuss Him, we discuss God. When we study or discuss Him, we study no less than God. The Holy Spirit is not number three in importance. He's not number three in deity, as I've demonstrated. They're, they're called and they're mentioned each at different times in various, in various order. All right, another idea. The Holy Spirit is a fully divine being. He is God. What is the proof in the Bible of the Holy Spirit's divinity? First of all, the Holy Spirit possesses the attributes of divinity. In Genesis 1 verse 2, it says, the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Notice here, he is eternal, appearing with the Godhead before the creation was fully formed. He exists as the Father and Son do apart from the creation and he is also outside of time. Another passage, 1 Corinthians uh, 2, verse 11. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so the thoughts of God, no one knows except the spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit is omniscient, knowing all things. He as God knows when a sparrow falls. That passage where Jesus said, your father knows when a sparrow falls. Well, so does the Holy Spirit know when a sparrow falls, as well as the inward thoughts of a man. In other words, he knows how and what God knows since he is God. God is eternal and all knowing. The Holy Spirit is eternal and all knowing. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is God. Another uh, mark of the Holy Spirit's deity. The Holy Spirit does the works of deity. In Psalm uh, 104, verses 24 uh, to 30, we read, O Lord, how many are your works? In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. There is the sea great and broad in which all swarm uh, in which are swarms without number, animals both great and small. Uh, there the ships move along and Leviathan, which you have formed to sport in it. They all wait for you to give them their food in due season, uh, season. You give to them, they gather it up, you open your hand and they are satisfied with good. You hide your face, they are dismayed. You take away their spirit, they expire and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit the Holy Spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. So the Holy Spirit has the power to create. The power to create what is seen from what is unseen is exclusively held only by a deity. And we see that in verse 30, you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face uh, of the uh, of the ground. For example, the father speaks to the creation or rather he speaks the creation into existence, Genesis 1. The son multiplies the five loaves and the two feed, uh, fish to feed 5,000 people in Matthew 14. Uh, he transforms a water into wine, uh, John chapter two. And the Holy Spirit causes Mary to conceive, Luke chapter 1, 35. Is any one of these miracles less than another? Is it, is, it, is it more difficult to speak the creation into existence than to convert a couple of pieces of bread and fish in order to feed 5,000 people? Is it any more difficult to just say to someone, you know, the spirit will, will come over you and, and you'll conceive? 
Uh, so the virgin conceives. Uh, is any one of these acts more difficult than another? The one common thing about them is that they can only be produced by a divine being. So uh, the uh, Holy Spirit um, uh, does the work of uh, deity. Uh, another uh, passage here, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 11, it says, now there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit, and there are a variety of ministries in the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit uh, for the common good. Uh, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. So the Holy Spirit has the ability and the authority to give power to others. And we're gonna come back to this passage later on in the course, but for now, just making that point. For now, it's sufficient to note that the Holy Spirit can empower others to perform miraculous works. This ability is strictly limited to God. So the Holy Spirit has the attributes of deity and he does the works of deity. One other factor that points to his divine nature. The Holy Spirit receives witness that he is deity. He receives witness from heaven. This time we go to Revelation. It says, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you in peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits, that's the Holy Spirit, who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ. So we've mentioned all of them, haven't we? The faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom uh, priests to his God and father, to him be the glory and the dominion uh, forever and ever. He receives a witness from heaven. Note that John reveals the presence of the Godhead using the triune form and by placing the Holy Spirit, you know, the seven spirits, by placing him first, then the Son, and then the Father last. This was done not to, not to change the order of importance, but rather to confirm the equal nature of importance of each person in the Godhead. He also receives witness from Jesus. In John 16, he says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the father has are mine. Therefore I said, he takes of mine and will uh, disclose it uh, to you. And so Jesus himself refers to the Holy Spirit and this divine task he will perform in service to the apostles on behalf of Jesus and the Father. The witness from the word itself in Luke three, it says, now when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was open and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came out of heaven. You are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. So the Holy Spirit's presence as part of the Trinity at Jesus's baptism is witnessed, is recorded, is preserved in Luke's gospel for every generation to see and know until the end of time that the Holy Spirit is God along with the Father and the Son, each separate but one in the divine Godhead. So let's uh, summarize here. We've got five minutes. The Trinity, a word that does not appear in scripture, but is used 
to describe the complex and dynamic nature of God revealed in the Bible as an entity that comprises of three distinct divine beings existing seamlessly in one Godhead. Now we use the term Godhead to refer to God while acknowledging his unique and dynamic uh, character. The Holy Spirit is a distinct person and being within the Godhead. So when you're referring to him, you're referring to no less than God. The Holy Spirit also receives witness of his deity from heaven's throne, the Father, from Jesus, the Son, and from the Bible. These vouch for his deity. Okay, two last questions. Who is the Holy Spirit? He is a distinct divine being within the Godhead. He is God. Another question. What is the difference between the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit? Well, of all the modern translations of the Bible, it is only the King James Version that uses the term Holy Ghost. 90 times it uses the term Holy Ghost, seven times it uses the term Holy Spirit. No reason uh, is given since the words come from exactly the same Hebrew and Greek words. There's no, you know, it's just the way it was translated in English. As time, uh, uh, at the time when the King James Version 1611 was written, the term ghost referred to the living essence of a person and the word spirit referred to the uh, essence of a person who had died and their essence or spirit had departed. So when you talked about the ghost, you talked about the spiritual nature of an individual who was alive. When you talked about the spirit, you talked about the same you know, spiritual nature, but that had departed from the body, okay? So as language evolved, people started using the term ghost when speaking of the vision of a dead person, while the word spirit became the standard term for life or living essence. Bible translations followed suit, translating the Hebrew and Greek terms into the English word spirit and Holy Spirit instead of ghost or Holy Ghost. And today, even when you use the word ghost, it's mostly related to Halloween, right? Uh, ghost and goblins, you know, so. Uh, that's another reason why that was uh, split up. And then one more slide. What will happen to the Holy Spirit at judgment? Well, since the Holy Spirit is eternal, there will be no change in his status. However, how he will interface with glorified and exalted saints is not known, or I haven't discovered it yet. Okay. All right, next week, we're going to look at the character, we, you know, we know the character, don't we, of the father. We know his character and even the son, we've, we read about the son, his character, but does the Holy Spirit have a character? We're gonna read about that next week. All right, that's our lesson. Thank you for your patience.